Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of Cooking with Grief, the internet's longest running podcast about ducks. In previous episode, we've covered the bill, the weird foot thing, and the feather. And this week, we're tackling the big one, the body. I'm a human quiche called Chris, and joining me as ever is my co-host and resident quack interpreter, Chris. Uh, hi. I think I've stumbled into the wrong podcast. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, we do, <laughs> we do, we do, we do the duck one on on Thursday. Sorry. Okay. All right. Sorry. So this is this is cooking with grief, the comedy podcast where two friends called Chris talk about two topics each that they've learned about in the week. Is that the one you booked for? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to specifically exclude ducks. Yeah. No. That one makes more sense. Right. Okay. Ma- Ma- marginally. <laughs> okay. This is me just throwing out all my material on ducks. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have a natter, uh, rarely on topic, and the rest, dear listener, is down to your functioning ears and the ability to interpret sounds into coherent sentences. Now, our one and only sort of semi-permanent feature is the Kurt Russell fact. So, Chris, what is your Kurt Russell fact for this episode? The last words Walt Disney ever wrote down were Kurt Russell. Nobody knows why exactly. I can only assume he had the same bizarre Kurt Russell obsession that I do to be yet another parallel with our lives. The more likely answer is that Kurt Russell was uh, he was working in Disney films at the time because he was a child actor and he was considered a bit of a rising star and presumably if he'd finished the note he might have said Kurt Russell should have another job doing something. Yeah, he was known for his vague note-taking, just yeah. <laughs> Well, apparently nobody's entirely sure why. It was just found on his desk after he died. This feature came about because I asked you what form you want death to take when it approaches. Maybe that was Disney's way ah. of letting you know that either death or God, perhaps, <laughs> does in fact take the form of Kurt Russell <laughs> to comfort <laughs> souls moving over just as death took him. He just reached for the notepad to warn us with what the angel of death all looked like. Yeah, maybe. Chris, what's your uh, first actual non-Kurt Russell-related topic? I'm going to talk to you about television from back in the day. Specifically, TV firsts. So, can you guess um, when the first interracial kiss happened on American television? Was it Star Trek? You are correct. Apparently, though, the uh, network didn't actually want to film it. Apparently, it is according to... uh, Cracked.com, where I find lots of my useless facts. And gainful employment at times. William Shatner uh, deliberately uh, sabotaged the versions that avoided the kiss by pulling faces in the background to ruin the takes, so that the only one that they could use was, in fact, the uh, take that ends with the uh, the kiss. Presumably he thought it was important to show that sort of watershed moment. Turns out in Britain we'd done it ten years earlier, but... Uh, you know, nice for Americans to eventually do the right thing. Well, you know, it's, they had a track record of turning up to things like... It's like the war. Eventually they get there. Oh, I, I meant the uh, inclusion of the pork pie in a diet. But yeah, also the, the World War thing. So um, now we've done something serious and groundbreaking like that. When do you think the uh, first toilet was to appear on TV? I mean, presumably before the interracial kiss and not simultaneously... I've not seen it, but did they get off in a bathroom? <laughs> they did not, as far as I know. 57. TV show called Leave It to Beaver. Only, they weren't actually allowed to uh, show the, the toilet itself. All they could show was the uh, toilet tank. I thought you were going to say, the turd floating in the... <laughs> 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 no. Dignity. No, they could show was the cistern. They couldn't show the actual toilet. That was that was too taboo. And it wasn't until 1971 where the first toilet flush was heard on TV. For some for something that's necessary for every human, I really don't get the, the sort of tiptoeing around it. It's like I remember distinctly from my childhood, like my grandparents' house, house of their generation. Like you couldn't have toilet roll on display because you didn't want to assume that you were su- such a beast as to have to use it. So that you had like <laughs> subtle coverings, like a, an actual like cloth that went over the toilet roll, and then like, <laughs> a, a, like a like a cover for the one in use. Did you do you have that in your life no. at all? <laughs> Maybe I'm just from a, a family of depraved <laughs> freaks. <then. laughs> but yeah, apparently in the uh, Brady Bunch, six kids shared a bathroom, but 
there was no toilet in it because they weren't allowed to show a toilet on TV. So what, they just showed them shitting in the sink? <laughs> Again, I, I don't think that's how they uh, how they got around that particular one. <laughs> yeah, which was cut out for taste reasons. You know, these various censorship things weren't always... Uh, wasn't always a logical progression. So apparently, the first couple that was shown in bed together was in 1947. You know, just sharing the same bed. Which was a TV show called Mary Kay and Johnny. But then, when I Love Lucy came out in the 50s, even though it was a uh, they were a real life married couple, they were depicted in two separate beds. And bearing in mind, this was just after America had been involved in like a huge war. And yet, they were like, no, no, it's too sensitive to see people in bed together, even though everybody knows that's what married couples do. Yeah, it's 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 so weird that, like, you know, you can turn on the TV and on the news, they'll have repeating footage of live scenes of, like, some horrendous mass shooting or uh, natural disaster, and you see in real time the human suffering play out. But then there's still people up in arms because there's a nipple on a show. Like, a, you know, an exposed one, not just the assumption that somewhere there was a nipple implied in the show. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's like weird... Double standards. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that sort of gets me as well is, you know, nowadays there's a lot of things on online, or not even online anymore, but people going on about political correctness gone mad. And they would say, you know, they want to go back to the good old days when everybody was not a sensitive snowflake. The harkening back to the days where toilets were considered offensive is like... That's like what days are you hankering after? <laughs> Unless it's specifically the days you could insult minorities and knew they couldn't really like have any recourse to complain. The whole philosophy behind "Make America Great Again" they never really made it clear when was America great and did it happen to be when white people, you know, straight white men were in charge of a hundred percent of the things instead of the ninety five percent they are now, and yeah. they had all the media coverage and all the decision making and I will say though the mid to late nineties were probably humanity's peak. I'm gonna I'm gonna nail my colours to the mast on that one. On what basis? <laughs> well, you know Oasis ruled the uh, charts, occasionally battling out with blur. You know, the Cold War was over, but Islamic terrorism hadn't really taken the public consciousness and whilst the IRA were, you know, st- still about the americans didn't care about them so you know they never really counted you went with oasis first <laughs> but both liam and noel gallagher now have separate bands constantly in the, the charts <laughs> it's not the same mate just listen to indie radio they play oasis all the time and the cold war's back it's just a little more one-sided now given that america's capitulated yeah that's what i mean so you were a child in the the 90s (laughs) what i think that's why i want to go back you want to be a simpleton then you don't want the 90s back (laughs) you want to care about (laughs) yo-yos again yeah basically (laughs) you want your main focus of the day to be swapping you know pokemon cards for a pokemon card you didn't already have yeah yeah they're just doing it on the the phones no. Please don't tell us that we're at that age where we start decrying the younger generations for the same pointless shit we get up to. Well, yeah, I think we are. I think we've always been <laughs> like that. <laughs> Even when we were that yeah, age. We were very cynical nine-year-olds going, <laughs> this is all futile. But today, a uh, 20-year-old said that I'm not old, and I was like, yes! I'm going to dine on that for the next year. Now, isn't it pathetic? I, I got asked for ID the other day, and I was like, you know what? I don't even need this this uh, official high now. <laughs> it made my day. The fact that my battered potato face could pass for something resembling youth. <laughs> it, it's not the inclusion of youth slang that makes me feel excluded. It's when words that are comfortably in my vocabulary are, are seen as ridiculous as, I don't know, our parents saying, hey, group, that's cool or rad or groovy or nebula or whatever we said as kids. Because it's like the other day I was at work and so these two like you know teenagers i use the word cool in the sense of like oh have you got you got the right change oh that's cool thanks and they're like huh, cool huh, that's really cool huh. and i was like 
what is cool not cool, Mel? Is is cool a signifier that I <laughs> am a pointless corpse? You know, just so far removed. As I, if I'd said, oh, that's that's lit, then then they thought I was cool. And then you think, why do you care so much that these twelve year olds <laughs> think you're cool or not? <laughs> you're at your you, your job. <laughs> you have authority here. <laughs> they don't think you're cool or not. They think you're lit. Yeah, that's true. Maybe maybe we'll smoke outside and ride our scooters. Yeah. I never had a scooter. No, me neither. I was just... I, that seemed like a relatable <laughs> thing to say. I lived, <laughs> I lived in the middle of nowhere on a moor until the age of 12. I had no friends. I had no, no childhood except those imagined in books. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, in a riff about being cool, I had to make up what I thought being cool was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scooters, uh, that's... And maybe we could buy some chips. Chris, you don't... You're trying to not eat carbs because <laughs> you had cholesterol. How the hell are you ever going to be cool? <laughs> You'll never be cool with that attitude. The desire to attain coolness is the most pointless endeavour I think it's fair to say at school, we were never popular and completely fine with that because we had two friends. And it's like, that's yeah. enough. And, then, <laughs> and now I have two friends. And in order to maintain a friendship, I started a podcast with one of them and occasionally text the other one. What more do you need? What more do you need from life? Yeah, who's making friends past the age of 12? Make your choices early and stick with them. And inevitably, they'll all get married and leave you. I was going to say, but we didn't meet until we were 14. I know, but I was keeping that slot open. <laughs> because I grew up on a, on a hill in the middle of nowhere. And then I moved to a place with other people and went, oh, you can actually hang out with people. You can, you can, you can converse with people. We were at some point talking about toilets on TV and now, now we're discussing your lack of popularity in high school. Once again, I turned it into a rambling, you know, self-directed therapy session <laughs> where I talk about my problems that no one else needs to hear. All right, okay, to get slightly back on topic, are there any taboos left on television? Well, yeah, but <laughs> like, <laughs> we're not going to see somebody like fist a cat on like question time, are we? <laughs> <laughs> so there are taboos. <laughs> yes, madam, you in the you in the red jumper. Um, yes, I, I was just wondering if I could ask the panel if they'd be willing to fist a cat. We'll, um, yeah, so, we'll go. <laughs> Boris so, Johnson. Yeah, there, are, there are plenty of <laughs> yeah, there are plenty of taboos left. All right. <laughs> Whether or not you mean things that are socially acceptable, but not not allowed to be seen on TV. Oh, not really, because I was just reading stuff. There's been gay couples on TV since, I think, like the 70s, I think it said. But there wasn't a lesbian kiss until 1991. Blimey. And then there wasn't a male homosexual kiss until the year 2000. E even now on, on shows like Game of Thrones, there's... Well, there, there's a lot of flaccid penis, but... Yeah. There's not well, you're not allowed to show a, uh, a non-flaccid penis. There'll come a time when that'll be uh, the next big thing. Just the last scene of Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, it's just a giant penis. Well, it's just, you know, the, the evil is defeated and the last scene as a credits roll is, is Jon Snow having a sad wank. <laughs> Spoilers. I was going to say, though, did you never see that TV show? I think it's called Naked Attraction. It was like Channel 4 where people, like, had to choose their partner, but, like, they were revealed. So there's, like, four people. So say, say, it's, a, say it's a man... And then it would be four women behind, like, screens. And then it would lift up and, you know, he'd see their feet first and then he'd, like, eliminate one based on their feet. And then it would go up to, like, the vag and they'd eliminate them based on the vag and then the boobs and then eventually the face. And, like, imagine just going into work on Monday after you've been on that episode. Like, saying hi to your colleagues and all your colleagues are like, Nice vag, Karen. <laughs> or, you know, nice penis, Richard. <laughs> like, how do you how do you go back from that? Well, I don't know. Having only just learned about the existence of this show, it's hard to process my feelings. Oh, you it's... did not know that was a show? I, 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 I hoped uh, I was just jogging your memory about it. I, I, I think I'd heard some... I didn't know it was full frontal nudity. I thought it was just... Oh, yeah, there's everything. Not like extreme close-ups of everything or that stuff, but like everything is on display and uncensored. 
Americans would shit a brick at that. <laughs> like, the idea of TV just having fully naked people on it would just be like, what? In the broader sense, like, body positivity and seeing bodies that, you know, look like yours is, is a good and educational thing and it's important. But to have it done in such a crudely, like, voyeuristic way of, like, slowly revealing just a, a panel of women that you get to openly judge. Well, yeah, at least it's not sexist, though, because, you know, it was, uh, you know, there'd be, like, you know, female contestant and male Oh yeah, I don't know. It's, it, Male. It, it, it's not just men Pool leering at where, people, where and naked women. Yeah, no, it's like it alternates between the two. And then the final round, if I remember, like the woman who was previously naked, like he chooses the you know. So again, we'll go back to the male on male chooser example. But like I say it works both ways. There's fem- could be female chooser, male, but the chooser then has to get naked and is judged by the person they've chosen. At what point do the personalities come into it? Well, the idea is, if you've seen each other naked, then you'll be more open when they go on the date afterwards, because then they go on a date, but they've already seen each other, and the idea, like, I say the idea of it, I mean, I think somebody came up with the concept and then worked backwards from there, (laughs) but, like, the justification, again, I've only seen, like, I think I've only seen one episode of it, like, and it was a while ago. So I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they see each other naked, then go on a date, and like they were like, see, now you'll be all uninhibited because you've seen each other naked. It is a daunting thing to get undressed in front of someone for the first time, I suppose. That's why it's always awkward to meet an ex, because you've seen each other naked, which changes everything, but you have to pretend that you've never seen each other naked. That's my theory on why, why they're always awkward encounters. You have to reel it back to a uh, place that it is no longer in. You have to reclothe them in your mind. And the other way around. You have to act as if they don't know your deepest, darkest secrets. I mean, I think you're doing all right if your deepest, darkest secrets are... Unless they're, they're tattooed out <laughs> they, one, you, one they, form. You, <laughs> you've, you know, you've yeah, got, it's like Memento. <laughs> yeah, if you've got a killed a man in Reno just to watch him die tattooed above your trombone. Is your secret then that your pretentious hipster who thinks like tattooing Johnny Cash lyrics makes them interesting? Please don't tell me you have a Johnny Cash lyric tattoo that I didn't know about. Um, not that one, no. What, Ring of Fire <laughs> on the other side? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, on a, on a, on a st- <laughs> s- still winter's night, you just hear a mournful. <laughs> 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 oh, I can't remember what we were talking about, but I think we're done. Yeah, I think we very tastefully uh, covered the <laughs> intricate politics of interracial relationships on, on TV <laughs> and the broader implications in a in a mass media. Yes, putting the world to rights. One Johnny Cash tattoo at a time. <laughs> All right, so after that waffling, rambling, circuitous route from kisses and toilets on TV, what have you got for us? Well, I'll start off with a question, as always. Chris, what's the best thing you've ever done by accident? Oof. I don't know, you know. Mm, I really should have a good answer, but... Uh... Other than this podcast, of course, when when I just admitted I was taping our phone calls and we thought we should really format this. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah? I'd have to get back to you. Oh, I'll ask you again when you've had your first kid. <laughs> <laughs> and then see if, how long your uh, marriage lasts. Well, the, the reason I ask that is because um, sort of the progress of science is not always a straight line and, you know, many famous inventions have simply been mistakes while in the pursuit of somewhere else. So, like... Alexander Fleming famously invented penicillin when he took too long to invent the cheese toasty. And crisps were invented by an impatient chef who was getting nagged by a customer that his potatoes weren't cut fine enough. And uh, the humble microwave came about because Percy Spencer just had to have snacks on him in the lab. Well, this accidental invention was new to me, but while researching a cure for feline AIDS, scientists accidentally created a glow-in-the-dark cat. (laughs) What? There's a lot to unpack there. So they're trying to cure feline AIDS because it might help cure human AIDS. So far, so good. So the stuff, the stuff that that ended up making the cat glow is a version of the green fluorescent protein that lights up the crystal jellyfish, a, a sort of type of jellyfish that lives off the west coast of the, of the US. Okay. And scientists realised that the gene for this uh, fluorescent protein is a is a good marker that when they insert it into a new gene into an organisation, it, it shows up by inserting 
uh, a version of this protein along with their gene of choice they could easily see if it's successful because the organism would glow did they cure feline aids no oh but they <laughs> they invented glow in the dark cats considering cats like to hunt at night that'd probably be so annoying <laughs> I'm just sneaking up on a mouse and the mouse is just like, well, there's a glowing green killer furball. Time to move. <laughs> so since discovering this, they've stopped being scientists and set up a boutique pet shop where they also sell glowing pigs, mice, Are you dogs sure and fish. They did this accidentally <laughs> and this wasn't just a ruse so they could be like, we're going to make millions by uh, making glow in the dark cats. But the only way we'll fund this is if we pretend we're trying to cure feline AIDS. You know, I hadn't considered that, but that does sound like they applied to go on Dragon's Den. They got knocked down, so they thought, oh, we'll get some spurious scientific funding and do it that way. What else did they make? Glow in the dark pigs? Pigs, mice, dogs, and fish. Is anyone buying these things? Do you have one? Oh, yeah, this is just my way of saying I bought a glow in the dark pig. So now I can have a glow in the dark pig. It struck me as the sort of science that gets glazed over in like the origin stories of a superhero film. Hmm. Like, blah, 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 trying to do something else, accidentally create a glow-in-the-dark superhero, and, you know, they're always light on the science. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, so maybe close to getting a superhero cat accidentally. Yeah, but would that be a sidekick to Catwoman or a, or a superhero in, in its own right? Oof, I don't know. And Because you can't just have a glow in the dark as your power because it's That's not limited. Yeah. Even in like a superhero like team, you're, yeah. you're glow not in the exactly dark, pulling man. your weight. <laughs> man who gives away our position. <laughs> you, know, you know, you've got Superman who's pretty much indestructible. Yeah. Unless there's a, a particular mineral nearby. And he goes, ah, Glow in the Dark Man will slightly illuminate not other things for you, but just himself <laughs> nearby in case you need to read road maps. Um, you know, if your phone's on low battery and you can't turn the brightness up, um, yeah. that's pretty much got <laughs> it. Maybe he could, like, stand by a wall to comfort a kid who doesn't like sleeping in the dark, but that has sort of creepy ramifications <laughs> that a superhero is just watching them. See, the thing you're saying, though, about like how you know science accidentally inventing stuff, is that's what's always got me about like superhero films, especially like Spider-Man and stuff, where like industrial accident seems to be the number one cause of uh, superpowers. <laughs> is surely you'd have, like once you've seen it happen like three times or so, somebody has been involved in an industrial accident and has gained superpowers... Like, you'd have people just throwing themselves into random things constantly, just being like, I may get atomized, but I may end up being Superman. And just jumping in front of, like, I don't know, just like x ray machines and stuff. Yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Let's go swimming in Cellophane. Well, thing, like, with, with um, Spider Man, the reason they had to rebuild it so many times is because you don't see the first 10,000 takes where whoever's playing Spider Man just gets incurable cancer. Yeah. It's, it's a very low odds that you're going to turn into. The Rhino or Quick Chris, think of another Spider Man uh, buddy, uh, Dr. Octopus. Yes. I nearly said Dr. Squid then. I thought that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Similar, just sort of a bit more inky rather than. Because as, as someone who's not familiar with superhero films, they t seem to fall into two categories either mutated or cybernetic. So it's like either they're like. Batman, who's a rich dude with gadgets, or like a monster with powers. That is essentially it. Or alien. That's the other one. So Doctor Octopus is just like a dude with mechanical arms on his back. Yes. Which is not octopus-like in any way. He doesn't cram into small spaces. He doesn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doesn't eat a diet consistent mainly of crustaceans. <laughs> Well, I don't know that. I don't know how deep into the lore it goes. <laughs> I don't know. Why not call him just, like, six arms? Steve. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, since he ends up with eight limbs, he's more of a Spider-Man than Spider-Man. There's a Batman villain called Man-Bat, who is actually... Um, what, like, a he bat ends up that pays mutated. taxes? Yeah, basically. He's a man who ends up... Oh, he probably does pay taxes, and he ends up mutating himself with, like bat DNA, and again, another stupid industrial accident, and uh, becomes a giant, like, six-foot bat. Do you think that's what Ozzy Osbourne was doing when he ate a live one on stage? <laughs> you know, apparently he claims he thought it was rubber. And it's like, surely if it was rubber, it wouldn't be moving and, like, trying not to be eaten. Even if it was rubber, <laughs> would your first thought to be to take a big old bite out of it? You always see those, like, excuses where people say, like, I thought it was something else, and it's like, that still doesn't explain your actions. I remember in the news a few years ago, somebody got arrested because they punched a baby. Like, just went up to a stranger in a supermarket and punched the baby. And then his defence was, 
Sorry, I thought it was a doll. All right. E- even then. Why did you punch the baby? Like, why did you punch the doll? Like, that doesn't actually answer, like, or excuse your actions. Yeah, it's like, it's like you know, you're charged with, you know, stealing a car and driving off. It's like, well, I I thought it was a Thursday. What? Well, that's not yeah. anything to do with it. It's like, okay, and... In their head, they're convinced there's some logic there. But, like, externally, everyone's just like, not seeing the link there, but, like, but they... Yeah, I mean, is that not the way modern life is now? That all the batshit conspiracy theories and people are on such a different wavelength is that they are using a level of logic that you fundamentally can't and won't (laughs) understand. So it's like flat earthers are prepared to ignore thousands of years of scientific discovery because of one logic that they've formed in their their brain. I, you know, I am fully accept that governments throughout the world are doing shady shit and keeping it secret. Like, oh, all the time. Everyone, you know, yeah, this is definitely happening. But the thing is, I'm always like, there's always a complexity level, because bear in mind that, you know, multiple times government like members have left important briefings and stuff on, like, trains mm. and stuff like that. Like, they're not dealing with, like, supervillains here. Very fallible. And also... Like the reward for doing it. So there's like n- the flat earth theory, which I re- at first I thought was entirely ironic, but now the more it goes on, the more like, pretty sure some people are genuinely believing this. Yeah. It's like they say NASA's keeping it a secret, and it's like, but why? Like, what does NASA have to gain by pretending the world's, like, round? Yeah. And how, like, how are they keeping it secret? How are they getting every single, like, maritime, like, navigation? <laughs> Like yeah, thing. working for everybody who has ev- ever sailed around the world to like also buy into it and be like, oh yeah, no, I definitely sailed around the world, even yeah. though I couldn't physically. Like, how are they doing all this, and what are they gaining from it? It's like the whole uh, Illuminati thing. Like, there is one worldwide government that is in control of everything, and what we know as governmental politics is just a charade to keep us distracted, right? Because if you really drill down to it, it's a desire to believe in order where there is just baffling chaos it's yeah. like oh yeah it's like they want to believe so much that there is a reason behind everything that it's it's actually a sort of form of comfort when actually mm. it's rooms full of mostly men making decisions that will benefit them first and foremost and then you know hopefully the rest of the people in their country it's just people who get into rooms that make decisions and it's like there's no like world plan that is it's just idiots faking their way through life trying to, you know, pretend that there's all, you know, reason behind just this vacuum of pointless chaos. Yep, and just the, like, a sort of addition on that, I think there's also the desire to be the one that sees through it all as well. So not only is there an order behind the chaos, but also you're the one that is, un- you know, you're not one of those blind fools. Because that's the pro- other problem with conspiracy theories, is they're always the, like... So, you know, there's always these 9-11 conspiracy theories, or truth and movements, or whatever. Because there's lots of arguments about various parts of it, of varying degrees of, like, convincingness. But one of the, like, arguments that really, like, sort of baffles me is that I think it's World Trade Center 7. Like, it was, like, a smaller building, like, next to the two towers. Um, you know, part of the same complex, but a lot smaller. Collapsed, um, but it wasn't hit by a plane. And people are like, see, why would the building collapse if it didn't get hit by a plane? And it's like, so for this conspiracy theory to work, you have to have thousands of people sort of faking missing airplanes, faking grieving families for the, you know, for the aircraft things, either faking the data or getting in the investigators and so on and everybody else in on the conspiracy. Secretly planting all the bombs in these buildings, all these different things have to go on. And yet they overlook the fact that they only had two planes and we're like oh yeah we'll blow up three buildings with two planes uh should we not just we've already spent like billions on this should we not just get another plane in vault no 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 we'll just go with two and we hope nobody notices it's like it's like the moon landing as well it's like people are like oh why is the flag flying when there's no wind on the moon and it's like oh they for- they faked all these things and forgot that there's no wind as opposed to the much more realistic thing that it's a flag with a wire in it because they knew there was no wind and that the flag wouldn't fly unless they, like, made it, like, rigid. This episode is sponsored by the Illuminati. We are... (laughs) We are nowhere. We are nowhere and everywhere. And we 
we proudly thank you for the billions of untraceable non-consensual <laughs> dollars that you paid us for this book. We'll see you at the meeting in January. I'll have the prawns. <laughs> I wonder what food they'd serve at, at like the head of the, the like Illuminati meeting. It's got to be like real, like illegal stuff, like like rare panda steak and yeah, like blue whale. One of uh, one of the queen's kidneys. And garlic bread, because it's just classic. <laughs> yeah. You can't be garlic bread. You can't be garlic bread. That's actually the motto of the Illuminati and spoiled out of control. Mate, this is just a garlic bread fan club that really spoiled out of control, and now we somehow have world dominance. But we remember our roots. Yes, and that ties it nicely back into the vase thing you've ever done by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally took over the world when trying to start a garlic bread fan club. Because if they haven't, we will. So that's the first of my two topics. Chris, what have you got for your second one? Well, I'm going to talk about unexpected consequences. Do you know anything about the New York blackout of 1977? Basically, 1977, there was a blackout, including the title of New York blackout of 1977, (laughs) affected New York City. But um, basically, apparently, because, well, a combination of factors, apparently it was like a big heat wave, which for some reason, side topic, but for some reason, and nobody's entirely sure why, there's always a surge in violent crimes during heat waves all across the world. Like, hotter weather leads to a spike in crime. When it, when it gets too hot and I'm just lethargic, it's when I do, <laughs> the, you know, my least, <laughs> least amount the of least crime. amount of crime. Because I can barely, I just like to slump in front of a fan and complain. Like I say, there was a heat wave, uh, apparently it was during like, bad economic uh, downturn as well so everyone was feeling shitty and angry and whatnot and so there was just apparently incredible widespread looting and riot but the unexpected consequence that came out of that was hip-hop the reason was was because rap and all that usually relies on samples and beats in the background which you know, especially back then, before like the advent of digital music and everything, you know, you literally needed a turntable and some vinyl records and to actually mix it like on the go. And uh, turntables are expensive, but they're very cheap when you ram raid a uh, electrical store. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, people, you know, were just robbing left, right, and centre. And it basically ended up with a bunch of people who otherwise couldn't have afforded, you know, DJ equipment. Ended up with them and then experimenting and mixing it with like the rap that was sort of already happening. And then boom, hip hop. I don't know how music sort of spreads. Like how does some like a genre just like obviously punk seemed to just be like people got instruments and instead of actually like being cla- like more classically trained or whatever, they just did what came to them and sort of it all became about the energy. It the was sort of- a sort of response to the over-produced sort of full-blown virtuoso <clears throat> prog rock of the prog 70s, rock. yeah. Very few panpipes on punk rock albums. <laughs> Only bagpipes if you're in the Dropkick Murphys. I, I guess earlier, even ro- like rock and roll generally, you know, it's stolen from black musicians in the, in the South who are doing sort of blues and it evolves from there and it's well actually we know how rock and roll started marty mcfly uh went back to 1955 played a chuck berry song and then chuck berry heard it and you know got into an infinite time loop no <laughs> okay <laughs> i thought that was how it happened it's it's one one leading theory it's it's <laughs> either that or white people stole it which is a, a fairly good assumption to be made at any point in it. <laughs> point in history. How did that come about? Oh, white people are wrong I don't know. The thing with all that stuff, though, is I quite like when music and culture and stuff mixes, and now everything seems to be accused of appropriation. You know, and being used to shut down... I mean, don't get me wrong, there was definitely times when, like, one culture just takes something and says, this is ours now, fuck you. But now it seems to be an accusation levelled at literally anybody of the wrong race or ethnicity doing something from outside of that niche it's when people like i've seen you know, occasionally videos go viral or whatever of some people getting angry at a white guy with five in dreadlocks and whilst most white people with dreadlocks just look faintly ridiculous you know it's just a hairstyle it doesn't mean anything and before anybody says it is a cultural thing i'd like to point out that it actually spread to jamaica from india it was actually jamaican's culturally appropriating Indian stuff, if you want to be like that. But it's not seen like that. It's just seen as, yeah, Jamaica was like a 
bit of a melting pot, mostly forced yeah. melting yeah. pot. Let's be honest. <laughs> but, like, but that is a very, a very generous of, like... way of describing it. <laughs> a, uh, a a shotgun yeah. melting pot. <laughs> yeah, but like it genuinely spread because you know because it, obviously there was a lot of people from Africa, mostly West Africa, taken over as slaves. Obviously, with it being the British Empire, they also shipped people from all over. And there was a like significant minority, you know, come over from India. And now one of the traditions and stuff in some parts of India is for them to not cut their hair. And there are places in India where there's people where there are like dreadlocks are common. And then obviously, and that's how it sort of spread to them. It spread from Jamaica to other parts of you know the black diaspora, and then that's all. So a white person also having dreads, besides looking ridiculous, so don't miss. Yeah, I mean, issue, aste- a- aesthetically, it's it's an awful choice for for, for most white people. Yeah. <laughs> but th- I think th- that that spread of cultural information is hugely different to, I don't know, like Katy Perry getting in trouble for dressing up like a geisha at a music awards. If it's specifically like a geisha, yeah, maybe. If it's Japanese clothing of non specific rule type thing. You know, there's a difference between wearing... I'm trying to think what a British equivalent is. <laughs> it always comes back to Morris dancing, which is a really embarrassing I, I, I think it's, it's when... You, it, it's a difference between between learning about someone else's culture and, and taking on that as opposed to wearing someone else's culture as a costume. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that's the appropriation yes. thing. Like, I'm certainly not the right person to ask because, like you say, there's nothing in my culture that anyone wants to nick apart from you know, a love of, of soft cheeses and Morris dancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, though, then it just becomes a sort of, I don't know, like, there are plenty of things from English, British culture, even or wider Western European, which, again, you can basically just thank the Romans for stealing everything from the Greeks and then spreading it. But you wouldn't consider it appropriation if anybody else used, you know. Yeah, but it, but again, again, it's the difference between right. like a, a transition of like centuries old transition between cultures and like yeah. okay, so for example, well, when I was at, at uni, there was a nightclub that got in trouble because they were advertising like like race specific fancy dress nights. You'd get like a bunch of like ro- like rugby lads in like Bob Marley t shirts and like wearing fake dreads and even like blackface. And then, mm. like, that yeah. allows them, you know, half price drinks because they're in costume. Mm. That's, like, not respecting a culture in any way, I don't think. Like, yeah. Like, if you're, so. if you're literally, like, dressing up as someone, whereas if you were in Jamaica and you were offered by Jamaican people to take part in some cultural thing, you're being it's 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 from a place of invitation rather than a dressing up as a costume. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I don't know. Also, like, it's a tricky thing. I don't know. Is that again? And we've spoken about similar things before. Is that weird thing where you got to not allow people to dominate and marginalize, but at the same time, if you don't allow the flow of ideas. You end up boxing everybody off even more than they already are. It's a fine line that we are in no way <laughs> equipped to, like, to deal with. Yeah, definitely not. Like, of all the people in the world, we are not the uh, we are not going to be the no. ones to bring balance. To yeah, this if you if you equation. want a spurious introduction to the idea of cultural appropriation, this is where it starts, and there is so much more qualified <laughs> reading to take on after this. Don't go. Well, I listened to Cooking with Grief, and they sort of talked around the subject a bit. Yeah, they they talked about it a bit and couldn't sat, settle on a conclusion <laughs> between the two of them. Well, once they became oh, aware of dear. how little they knew, they soon stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should have, but they're going to keep yeah, going. That's, uh, yeah, because <laughs> this is one thing we don't know its boundaries. Yeah, so that's that's a lesson to uh, take away from this segment is that we know nothing, but we know nothing at length. <laughs> And we know that we know nothing. <laughs> and yet, do we do anything to fix that? Do we buffalo? <laughs> yeah. Well, to be honest, on that note, I think I uh, might hand the ball over to you now. Okay, I'll... Uh... Please take the cultural appropriation ball. <laughs> so, my next topic is blackface, good or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. Well, that's... That's all my topics for the day, so over to you, Chris, to lead us out of this black hole of mess that we find ourselves <laughs> in on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm going to try and end on a lighter note. So, 
As always, a question. Chris, on a scale of 1 to 10, how freaky are naked mole rats? Oh, incredibly. Correct answer. I would have accepted. Pretty, pretty <laughs> freaky, very freaky. Anywhere on a sort of 6 out of 10, or, or above, really. Because, most importantly, they sort of look like shaved balls. Yep. And that's my second topic for this week. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry, my research was a bit rushed this week. I, I really hope this isn't a segue into male grooming, like, and then your questions. So, Chris, what is the best method for removing the balls? Removing <laughs> the, the balls? balls. That, that is Don't something... That. that is... That goes beyond manscaping. That is... Yeah. <laughs> How do you look like Action Man? <laughs> like completely smooth in the uh, never reach. Yeah, it's the, it's the segue into the weirdest oh. ad, ad read we'll ever have to do. <laughs> well, I like to use Jim's ball razors. <laughs> uh, no, so my second topic is uh, scientists have discovered that when deprived of oxygen, naked mole rats can switch to a metabolism. So its brain cells burn fructose for energy instead of glucose, which doesn't require... The well, fructose can be turned into energy anaerobically. Anaerobically. Yeah, so it doesn't require oxygen to be broken down to cellular energy. But I thought okay. that was, that was quite cool because naked mole rats, aside from being one of the most a pretty freaky creature, like just freaky, yes. freaky looking, they're the only mammal that can essentially pretend to be a plant and live. I suppose it comes in handy because I imagine they spend most of their life underground where there is less oxygen. They so they live really deep in the ground and in total darkness and uh, they live in sort of big groups of up to a hundred and just like mill about the place mill about yeah i was gonna say i wonder how the scientists found this out were they just like choking naked <laughs> mole rats <laughs> we're just like this one's not dead yet why <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how to science how was what today dear yeah i choked a lot of <laughs> naked mole rats i'm leaving you <laughs> you psychopath <laughs> Were they trying to make glow in the dark mole rats? <laughs> it's just like it's still not working. And so frustrated with a, the lack of progress, they choked them, and they yeah, they just said uh, harder, daddy, and they went ugh, gross. <laughs> they actually put them in oxygen deprivation tanks. They found science is weird. <laughs> yeah, it, we're really just finding is this for anything. If you're looking for a grant, <laughs> have you ever choked a mole rat? <gasps> That's a little personal. Buy me a drink first. No, no, no. <laughs> literally, have you ever... <laughs> no, so they can survive for five hours at oxygen levels, so low a human would die in minutes. And another study showed that they can uh, endure 18 minutes of total oxygen deprivation by slipping into a sort of vegetative state where they they metabolise uh, fructose instead of glucose. By comparison, mice without oxygen die after about 20 seconds. So you can choke a mouse... For less than a minute and finish the job. But the mole rat will keep going for 18 minutes. Yeah, mocking you. Yeah, so today on Cooking with Grief, we've learnt that uh, if you're going to choke a rodent, choke a mouse. <laughs> it depends what your end goal is. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. It, uh, <laughs> or do, a mole rat. Do you burn quickly but bright? Go for a mouse. Do you want a more prolonged choking of a rodent? Go for the uh, uh, na- na- naked mole rat. And if you have any sort of conscience at all just do neither yeah that is also an option <laughs> um less sciencey if you have to choke a mammal go for a human with express prior consent and don't kill them P- preferably ideally i feel like we're we're quite a effective uh, public service announcement here do not choke people to death <laughs> and only choke them in the first place if they consent once again, coming down with the bold stances. I know, we were really tackling the, the uh, big ones. You know, we n- didn't definitively settle on any of the big ones around race or cultural appropriation, <laughs> but we are no. co- we are confident in our uh, stance yeah, of... Choking policy. <laughs> yeah, the, the smallest hills to die on with Chris and Chris. <laughs> in fact, the hills were... We're rather confident we won't die on is the ones we're prepared to die on. No, I might get a little out of breath, but that's just because it's a hill and not because of the... (laughs) Not because you're not a naked mole rat. Maybe not in this life or any other life at all. I'm fairly confident in coming down on the side of reincarnation not being a thing. Ooh, controversial. (laughs) For us, maybe, but in the grand scheme of things. Whenever there's a report like this,
this or a study, then the question is, well, how come they can choke a mole rat for 20 minutes, but they can't cure the common cold? Well, what the, the end research is, is to find ways of... Curing feline AIDS. <laughs> yeah, is to, to make glow-in-the-dark glow cats not glow-in-the-dark anymore. It's it's things like like humans don't do well at oxygen deprivation at all, and that's why we suffer strokes and stuff after just like so so easily with with oxygen deprivation. So it's working out why mole rats can do this, and is there any way that can apply to humans? Because that's what science is for: is can we make can we keep ourselves alive for longer and continue to eat cheeseburgers at a, quite a frightening rate? <laughs> the main solution maybe be maybe exercise and eat healthier and and don't drink or smoke that much. Uh, not at all. No, I think I think doctors a... uh, doctors tend to say don't smoke at all <laughs> <laughs> these days at Usually. least. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not back in the day where they prescribe you a pack of cigarettes for yeah, uh, anxiety yeah. or asthma. Yeah. <laughs> see that that was my problem because I've although I've quit now the uh, I, I did go and see a doctor but he was you know he'd been practicing since the fifties and hadn't, hadn't updated all his thing prescribed me a pack of cigarettes and and I got hooked. That was it? And uh, my asthma just got worse. But you looked cooler. Or more lit, or whatever <laughs> whatever the phrase is these days. Yeah, uh, I looked uh, carcinogenic, I think the cool kids are saying. I still can't believe cool's gone out the window. No, it's not. We're going to have to keep it. It's been, it's, so, it, it's been like, venerable since, like, the 60s. Like, we can keep cool. Yeah. The yeah, thing is, though, it'll, ah, see, so I reckon... Oh, this is going to sound old. Jesus Christ. I feel like I've started, so I should continue, but yep. like, just before I said it, my brain was like, this is going to make you sound so old. But I reckon Lit and whatever other things these kids were uh, saying will be one of those ones that's like sort of cycles out very quickly. Yeah. Like Rad. It had a heyday of about a year when like Point Break came out. Oh, Wicked. That didn't last massively long. Mint. Although I think that might have been more of a regional one. I just like mint class. Is, is yeah, it a favourite one? I've, no, I've never heard anybody say mint like outside of Manchester. Except like as a verb to process money. Or as a herb. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be a more obvious one. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to the end of our 11th grief-based culinary offering. If you've uh, finished the final course of shame and brie, then we'll slide you the bill and hurriedly move you out to the unforgiving night air. By which we mean say goodbye. I have been Chris. And you you have also been Chris, I assume. <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were going with it. I didn't know if you were just going to leave it as a declaration there. <laughs> like, you will forever be Chris. And I was like, okay. But yes, I too have been Chris, but not the same Chris. We have different voices. Uh, and other things as well. It's mostly the voice. It's not just one. Well, as far as our listeners are aware... Like that, so you could just be putting on different voices. What one schizophrenic person talking over themselves in in different uh, personalities? Yes. Well, if you've enjoyed either one of us or both of us, whoever we may be or are, hopefully you join us again next time for the latest bullshit audible offerings. Uh, so uh, goodbye and off you pop. Goodbye. <laughs> Once again, we have nailed the succinct outro <laughs> with a catchy tagline that is instantly recognisable. I tried off you pop, but. I don't know. It sounds quite dismissive. <laughs> Toodle pip. <laughs> Toodle pip. Cheerio. Hey, jinx. Yeah, see you later. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cooking with Grief. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email cookingwithgrief at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. That's at cookingwithgrief. If you'd like to hear more episodes, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you've got the time, then it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you.